Hey everyone, it's David with Streaming Relativity, home of the Astro DNA Observatory. Okay, so here's a quick uh, follow up to the Cosmic Twin video I published earlier this week. And in that video, we took a look at the Deerlick Galaxy grouping with the famous NGC 7331 Spiral Galaxy, which has a lot of similarities with our own Milky Way Galaxy. So NGC 7331, it was a target in Pegasus, in the Pegasus constellation. But if you recall, I also mentioned that I wanted to image galaxy groupings in the Perseus constellation as well. And that's what I want to cover today. So I'll drop a link to the Cosmic Twin video in the description below. And uh, while you're down there, go ahead and subscribe. That way you get notifications when new content is, uh, is published. Okay, with that, let's jump into NGC 1275 Perseus A. So that was the sound of the supermassive black hole in the core of NGC 1275, and that's the galaxy that we call Perseus A. Now the core of Perseus A is very bright, and it exhibits uh, what we call an emission spectrum that confirms it as a Seyfert galaxy. And Seyfert galaxies have something called an active galactic nucleus, or AGN for short. And that means that the black hole is actively feeding on the host galaxy itself. And so think about all that cosmic stuff that is circling within the core of NGC 1275. That's going to eventually fall into the black hole, crossing the event horizon, disappearing forever. But in that process, a significant amount of energy is uh, being emitted radially, like in, and often in the form of plasma jets. Now, we can detect that as X-ray signal or radio waves. And in fact, that's, that's what uh, th those signals, NASA took those signals and sonified them by raising them, uh, raising the original signal up about 57 octaves so that it became audi audible to, to our ears. And that's what gives that eerie, that eerie sound. Um, but what makes this image really amazing is that Perseus A is one of thousands of galaxies that make up the Perseus Cluster. And unlike the Deerlick group that we looked at earlier this week, the galaxies within the Perseus cluster do, in fact, interact with each other. They are gravitationally bound to each other, and therefore the Perseus gal uh, galaxy cluster is a single object. It's the, one of the largest structures in the known universe. And Perseus A is actually dead center of it. And how cool is it that anyone uh, with a modest telescope and a little bit of patience can actually capture an image of Perseus A and, and this cluster? Think about it. The light that's um, uh, in this image has traveled 250 million light years to arrive on the camera sensor. And this, this, this happened to have arrived on December 8th, 2023. And, uh, you know, anybody can do this. So why don't we take a look at how I did it and how you can do it too. Okay, the very first thing that I like to do is to refresh myself on the target and the surrounding objects in the night sky. And uh, I began with a printed star chart uh, featuring the Perseus constellation. And we can easily spend a year on the DSOs in Perseus. But for this video, let's just look at the constellation boundaries, the shape of the constellation, and highlight where we should find NGC 1275 in the night sky relative to the major stars in the constellation. So Perseus occupies the declination uh, between uh, 30 and 55 degrees north. 
and that's for RA values that are roughly an hour and let's call it an hour and 30 minutes to roughly four hours and 45 minutes or so. So NGC 1275 is um, uh, in that range and actually it's, 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 it's close to uh, Algol, which is the uh, Beta Percy star, uh, second brightest star in the constellation. It's also known as the Demon Star, and uh, you should research that, and you'll be amazed by some of the stories and the symbolism and the mythology that's associated with Algol. Um, but that's a totally different video. Um, note that on the star chart, you're, you're typically not going to see NGC 1275 or most of the Perseus cluster galaxies that that appear in the image that uh, that we've shot. Um, and that's because these galaxies are just so faint. They're, they're so faint that they don't show up. And you're going to need to use planetarium software such as Stellarium or Sky Safari. And um, here, here I, I'm using a proper amount of zoom so that we can see that zoo of galaxies with NGC 1275 uh, at, at the center. So uh, with that, we can go ahead and and run a simulation for the evening. I use Stellarium for this purpose. And note that uh, NGC 1275, the target, uh, the target uh, for for the simulation, is nicely positioned high in the sky near near the zenith, and and it's uh, just past the meridian at around 11 p.m. And that gives us a solid four or five hours to you know to capture data. And with that, we have everything that we need to know to to to, to set up a, a proper Nina sequence. And, uh, and a reminder, when I'm shooting star fields and galaxy clusters, uh, even galaxies themselves, I usually like to stick um, with LRGB channels. And uh, for this image uh, that, that we're talking about in this video, I used, uh, obviously, the ASI 1600 monochrome pro camera, and I, and I paired that up uh, with my Celestron C8 SCT. I, I use a 0.63 focal reducer electronic filter wheel, they're one and a quarter inch filters, uh, and an autofocuser. So, so effectively I'm, I'm, I'm shooting at about 1280 millimeters of fold, uh, focal length um, at 6.3 uh, um, f-stop. So uh, all of this is mounted on my Ioptron CEM120 on a permanent pier within my AstroDNA observatory. Uh, which, for anybody who's interested, this is a rescued eight, eight, eight foot explorer dome. Now, you certainly don't need an observatory. You don't need observatory grade mount uh, such as the CEM 120. You can just as easily capture this image using uh, a C8 with a well aligned portable setup. Uh, I, I've worked with the, the, the Ioptron um, GEM 45 and have had uh, great success with the C8. So, so with that, let's take a look at the, the Nina sequence that I have set up for, for the session. Okay, so for those who follow the channel, you're probably familiar already with my workflow. I use Stellarium as my planetarium software, pull up, um, generally, I, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll pull up the target uh, of interest, in this case, uh, 1275. Uh, once I have that target uh, pulled up in the planetarium software, uh, using Nina, we can always go to the framing wizard, pull that target in, and uh, let's go ahead and pull Perseus A in uh, with Perseus A NGC 1275 in. Uh, uh, we can uh, add that target to our sequence, and uh, that would be a sequence of deep sky objects. So um, that's exactly the uh, workflow that I followed to, to begin uh, setting up the sequence. The only and 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 we'll, we'll talk quickly about the instruction set for NGC uh, 1275, but I'll just point out that you can have multiple targets, of course, in your sequence, and that evening on the 8th, I did. I, I As you recall, I shot NGC 7331, the Deer Lick group, um, and then I shot uh, Perseus A, um, and so I had two targets in, uh, in the sequence uh, for that evening. And um, and you know uh, uh, you know as I mentioned I, I'm an, uh, I, I like to use uh, uh, my LRGB uh, filters when when shooting star fields or galaxies um, or galaxy clusters. The only difference uh, and and in this case uh, as I looked at my uh, stacks and my raw data that I collected that evening, I noticed that I I did actually shoot luminance at uh, 120 sec 120 seconds at 139.21. Uh, which is the unity gain, 
and uh, I don't know whether or not that was an error on my part or um, or deliberate. I, I actually can't remember at this point, but uh, I only captured around 18 frames. Uh, um, I threw away a lot of frames um, that I, I was unhappy with. Um, note that uh, in this sequence, I actually start with a wait. I wait until 11 p.m. Uh, that way, I, uh, my target is uh, past the meridian. And uh, other than that, slew in center and, uh, uh, and, and take 30 exposures, two minutes each on each LRGB uh, filters at the end of that target, we go through the, uh, our shutdown uh, sequence, and in my case, shutdown is pretty straightforward. Find telescope home, find dome home, and close dome shutter. So that's that's roughly uh, that that's my basic template uh, for uh, for shooting these types of targets. Just quickly looking at the PhD two logs uh, for uh, for that sequence for that session, four hours thirty four minutes. Uh, looks like we had a total RMS of uh, 0.61. Uh, arc seconds, uh, total RMS, and that includes uh, a period, I, I shot some hydrogen alpha actually as well towards the end of the session, not reflected in the sequence instructions, but, and it got a little bit wild at that point, it was getting, uh, 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 I, I guess the scene was starting to really uh, fall off at that point. So at any rate, this is, uh, th this is the uh, PhD2 log, this is the sequence that was used. Okay, with that, we're going to go and take a look at um, some of the subs and the stacks. Okay, so I've got Pics Insights open, and uh, let's take a quick peek at the data. Let's start with the subs. Um, uh, Luminance sub, this is one, uh, one frame, 120 seconds at 139.21, 139 game, 21 offset, unity gain. Um, really uh you know pretty clean we can see uh evidence of our galaxies throughout the frame and uh same uh, same held true for each of the uh without very much variation for each of the uh channels red green blue um and uh they they all looked about uh about the same um in terms of quality in terms of uh and if anything, the signal was uh, on the blue frames uh, a little bit, uh, a little, a little bit uh, muted. Uh, but let's let's take a look at that though. So, uh, what I really cared about is statistics. I I for some reason shot 120 seconds on luminance, which is uh, unusual. Uh, I, I think I could have done it in error. I don't know. But anyway, the mean ADU values turned out to be around 3,000, which is probably three times what I normally uh, target with the 1600, the ASI 1600, but it does not seem to have impacted my, you know, the quality of uh, this photograph. So I'm going to do a little bit of research on that and see uh, what others are, are, are targeting in terms of ADUs for their subs. But if we compare that to, let's say, the uh, red sub, uh, now we get down into the values that I typically target, you know, 1,200, 900, 1,200 ADUs on mean, uh, uh, on mean. And uh, this, if we go down to the blue sub, let's take a look at what the blue sub had. You know, the blue sub was down at around 1,000. Um, um, and so at any rate, this, uh, you know, that's what our subs looked like. Um, and uh, I was a little more selective uh, uh, when I did my stacking. Um, in terms of what subs I chose. Um, and just so everybody's clear about my workflow, it's really very straightforward. Um, I do my uh, stacking uh, with Deep Sky, uh, uh, I'm sorry, with Cyril. And then I uh, pull the stacks in, I do in a star alignment and I crop within PixInsight automatic background extraction, and then I linear fit. And in this case, it looks like I linear fit against the luminance frame. Uh, so I, uh, I, I, I brought everything uh, up and normalized against luminance. Um, and uh, then I did some noise uh, 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 extermination, <laughs> noise reduction on this. So what do the stacks look like? Uh, the uh, crop the line stacks, they look pretty good. Um, why don't we go look at the stretched image? The stretched images will be a, a little bit better. So this is a the stretched luminance uh, stack and uh, clearly we have uh, really, really awesome uh, galaxies throughout the frame. And this is, it was at this point that I realized that this is going to be a very nice photo, a nice astro image. And, uh, you know, same, same exact thing with red, uh, blue, and, uh, and, and uh, red, green, and blue. We had 
similar high quality um, uh, um, captures here, really high quality uh, stacks. And, uh, and again, really very happy. Uh, really very happy with the data. So yeah, we took that data, moved it over into the color study uh, workspace, where um, and, you know the color, you know the colors really uh, came together nice with the LRGB combination tool. I did absolutely nothing. I think I maybe did a little bit of curves transformation on it just to get the make sure that I had nice dark uh, uh, background um, background sky, um, and the color balance was right where I wanted it to be anyway I, I I liked it and uh but I think the image really pops when you added when you add the annotations and there's a couple of um um uh, process uh, scripts that that help with that but once you start to uh, uh annotate these types of images and you start to realize exactly what you've captured um uh, that's when you really get happy so um uh, you know the process is re really very straightforward with PixInsight um, to get to this final final image, and uh, we'll go ahead and we'll take a look at that uh, in more detail now. Okay, I thought it would be cool if we took a look at the image and um, started to count galaxies. So let's start with NGC 1275, which is actually two galaxies. It has a core galaxy and the high velocity system that's merging with it. And uh, then if we kind of just start to zoom out and, and count, so we're at two. Now we can see the PGC, which is a primary uh, galaxy catalog, that's three. And then we have the NGC, uh, new general catalog, that's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. You get the point. Six, seven, eight. <laughs> so there are actually well over 50 um, galaxies in this image. And each one of them is an opportunity to research. Remember, galaxies come in all different shapes and sizes. And what's remarkable, this is a very, very small patch of sky. Let's take a look at that. If you stretch this out, we're talking about a little patch of sky representing the um, the C8 field of view. And I just think it's absolutely amazing. Okay, everyone, I hope you enjoyed this latest video. I had a ton of fun making it. And I have two more images that I captured with the C8 in December. And I intend to publish those videos by the end of the year. So stay tuned for those. And uh, if you haven't already done so, go ahead and subscribe on the bottom. If you do that, you're telling me that you're enjoying the content. And it also gives you the benefit of a notification when new content is published. So thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. And I will see you on the next video.